it's been several years, I think, since the government housing or planning minister spoke at, at this conference. But throughout that period, the links between the CPRE and my department have remained strong, and rightly so. Uh, we've not only listened to your input, I hope you feel that we've taken it on board. Any honest assessment of the housing white paper will quickly spot the marks of your influence, whether it's the protection of the green belt, uh, our opposition to speculative development, or our insistence on community involvement in planning and design. Uh, your chief executive, Sean, welcomed our proposals. Your head of planning, Matt Thompson, said they showed promising signs of doing some things differently. Um, so having listened to your concerns and adopted many of your ideas, we now ask you to reciprocate with positive and practical support for new homes that are built in the right places, because we know that your influence can make a huge difference on the ground. I have enormous respect for the contribution your members have made to public life over many decades in your ceaseless campaign to protect and indeed to enhance the English countryside. As the MP for Croydon Central, I represent a community on the border uh, of Greater London and the Surrey countryside, uh, a frontier that was in many ways defined by Sir Patrick Abercrombie and the vision of the CPRE in the post-war years. I understand the value of living in one of the world's greatest cities while being able to enjoy the beautiful countryside of the North Downs on my doorstep. And I know, thanks to its designation as Greenbelt, it will be protected not just for me, but for my children and for future generations. And although I am and have always been a Londoner, I spent my summer holidays during my formative years with my grandparents in the Sid Valley in East Devon, an area of outstanding natural beauty, and I have a very deep emotional connection with that landscape. The CPRE has played such a distinguished role and for such a long time that you suffer from that paradox of success. Many people are completely unaware of your profound impact on the English landscape because they simply take it for granted. Now, of course, such blissful ignorance of the CPRE would be impossible for a planning minister. Um, Napoleon is allegedly once to have said that the people to fear are not those who disagree with you, but those who disagree with you and are too cowardly to let you know. Well, you can never accuse the CPRE of being cowards. And that's why, why we, while we count the CPRE as a friend, because friends can occasionally disagree. And friends can also have honest conversations. And today, Britain urgently needs to have an honest conversation about housing, because the lack, in the widest sense of the term, of affordable homes is one of the greatest barriers to progress that our country faces. So it's a uh, great pleasure to be here today to start that conversation in what is my first major public engagement since the publication of the White Paper. Much has um, changed in British politics since 2014, I think it was, when my predecessor Nick Bowles uh, spoke here. We've got a new Prime Minister um, with a new government, new Secretary of State, and as you'll have noticed, a new Housing and Planning Minister. Our country has also made the historic choice to leave the European Union and forge a new role for ourselves in the world. But I believe that something else important has changed too. A growing consensus is emerging about the need to build more homes. In 2010, 29% of people were supportive of house building in their area and 46% were opposed. Uh, by 2014, that had switched round with 57% supportive and 24% opposed. A few years ago, it was common for people to question whether we actually needed more homes. They'd argue that if we just brought empty homes back into use or cut immigration, there wouldn't be a problem. Now, of course, both of those things will help, but more and more people recognise that even if we do both of those things, and we will, we still need to build more homes. The facts speak for themselves. Since the 1970s, we've supplied an average of 160,000 new homes each year in England, far below what numerous independent assessments have said we need to build. You don't need a degree in economics to understand what happens when supply fails to keep up with demand. Across the country, the average house now costs almost eight times average earnings, an all-time record high. 
Here in London, the average home made its owner £22 an hour during the working week in 2015, considerably more than what the average Londoner was earning. Stop and think for a second, what will happen to wealth inequality in this country if we allow that trend to continue? But this is not just a London or home counties problem. Since 1997, the ratio of average house prices to average earnings has more than doubled in places as diverse as Boston in Lincolnshire, Lancaster and Manchester. Now that may sound like great news if you already own a property, but for those who don't, it means the dream of owning their own home isn't just a distant dream, it's getting further and further away. And if you stop and consider the implications, rapidly rising house prices aren't all good news, even for those who've already managed to get a foot on the property ladder. They make it harder for businesses to attract the skilled workforce they need to grow, which, hold back, which holds back our economy. They mean more people who rent need some help uh, from housing benefit, which puts up our tax bills. And they force families apart, compelling many of our children and grandchildren to leave the neighbourhoods in which they grew up because they can't find anywhere affordable to live. The difficulty of getting on the housing ladder means the proportion of people living in the private rented sector has doubled since 2000. And according to the latest English housing survey, 1.5 million people are sharing properties um, when they want to have a home of their own. The average couple living in the private rented sector is now paying half of their disposable income to their landlord every month, making it nigh on impossible to save for a deposit. And high demand, coupled with low supply, has created opportunities for exploitation. Unfair terms in leases, unreasonable letting agent fees, and landlords letting out dangerous, overcrowded properties. And finally, increasing numbers of people find themselves unable to find any home at all. So not only do we need to build homes to cater for our projected population growth, but also for the backlog that has built up. People in their 20s and 30s still stuck at home with their parents or sharing with friends or even strangers, often in overcrowded uh, conditions. And this is the point where our honest conversation requires the right terminology. There's long been a debate about whether the various independent assessments that I referred to earlier and the local assessments that all of your councils will be carrying out as they produce their local plans are measuring genuine housing need or what Sean has called aspirational demand. So let me just be clear about where the government stands on that crucial question. I fully accept that we can't meet the demand of everybody who would like to live in, say, the Cotswolds or the Peak District or the Yorkshire Dales. But let me be clear, the problem with our housing market today is not that too many people can't find their ideal home. It's that all too many people can't find a decent home at all. Young people living with their parents until well into their 30s, families living in overcrowded conditions, and increasing numbers of people unable to find anywhere to live and either being accepted as homeless by their local council and placed in temporary accommodation or in the worst cases, and to all of our shame, ending up on the streets. In her first speech as Prime Minister, Theresa May said the mission of her government would be to make Britain a country that works not for a privileged few, but for every one of us. Now, I'm sure it goes without saying for all of us that a country that works for everyone is not one where some of our fellow citizens are reduced to sleeping rough on our high streets. But nor is it one where young people are told they have to wait until well into their 40s to have a home of their own, or where people of all age, ages find themselves completely priced out of their housing market. So as a government, we can and we will provide help right now to those struggling in our broken housing market. But in the long term, the only way to solve these problems is to build enough homes, to meet both future and pent-up need Independent estimates suggest we need to deliver somewhere between 225,000 and 275,000 homes every year. Now that may sound simple enough, but it's a goal that's proved elusive for every government since the 1970s. We're not prepared to let that record continue, and that's why we published a white paper 
fixing our broken housing market, which resets housing policy, switching from demand-side interventions to a focus on increasing the supply. Now, the good news is we're not starting from scratch. Under my predecessors, house building recovered from the historic low that we inherited in 2010. Net additions to the housing stock, which is the key measure we use to, uh, to record our progress, increased from 145,000 in 2009-2010 to 190,000 in the last year for which we have figures 2015-2016. That's real progress, but it's not good enough. I spent my first few months as Housing and Planning Minister sitting in my office in Marsham Street, talking to as many people as possible to try to understand why we haven't been building enough homes. And I quickly came to one simple conclusion. Despite lots of people trying to pitch me one, there is no silver bullet solution. If there was, I'm pretty confident one of my predecessors as Housing Minister would have found it. I wish it wasn't so. If there was one big idea with the potential to transform our house building woes, it would have made this speech a lot shorter and it would have made the white paper much easier to implement. But I am convinced that what's actually needed is a whole series of interventions at every stage of the house building process. We need to make sure that we're planning for the right number of homes in the right parts of the country. Once developments have got planning permission, we need to make sure that they are built out quickly. And we need to diversify the market so that we're not so dependent on a small number of large developers to do that building. Now, the CPRE have long argued that failures in the housing market can't be solved simply by releasing more land for building. The White Paper clearly and unequivocally agrees with that view. Releasing more land in the right places is necessary if we're going to build the homes we need, but on its own, it will not be sufficient. Action is required on all fronts, and that's the approach we set out in the White Paper. Since it's probably the most difficult part of our conversation, let's start with planning. There are a number of problems with our planning system at the moment. Some councils still haven't produced a plan. In those areas, development is happening thanks to speculative applications, which are often resisted by local residents. It's slow, it's expensive, and it denies communities the chance to agree where they would like to see development go. Other councils produced a plan years ago, but it's now hopelessly out of date. Others still have got an up-to-date plan, but have ducked the tough choices that need to be made by failing to be honest about the level of housing need in their area. So we can't tolerate this patchy performance. We'll be insisting that every area is covered by a plan which must be reviewed every five years. And crucially, I think Sean recognised this in the CPRE's response, we will be consulting on a new way for councils to assess housing need, which we'll strongly incentivise councils to use, so that those plans start from an honest assessment of how much housing is required in their area. This consultation is a central plank of our reforms and we want you to be involved in it. We want to build a national consensus about the best way to estimate how many homes are required in each area, so that we can do away with the huge amount of time and money that is currently wasted arguing about this issue. We also want you to be involved in using another power you asked for, the ability for local communities to shape the design and mix of new homes. 73% of people say that they would support new developments if they're well designed, built in the right places, and in keeping with their local area. That's a view that I know you share, and yet there are some people who claim the CPRE is merely a respectable front for nimbyism, that behind your public objectives is a private refusal to accept any kind of development in rural areas. Now, of course, I know that's nonsense. You recognise that well-designed new settlements in sustainable locations can take the pressure off the green belt, and you have an unparalleled legacy in influencing the planning system, particularly in the years after the war. Your vision for garden cities and towns and villages has been adopted by the government and so is your preference for community design with extra power and resources for local areas to make it happen. So now you've got the government behind your ideas, I challenge you to go a step further and prove your detractors wrong. Support local communities in their quest for good design and actively seek out and champion the best design developments so no one can say that your words are not backed up by deeds.
Now, alongside greater ability for local communities to influence design, we're also introducing new measures to help councils identify appropriate sites for development. In all but exceptional circumstances, that will exclude the green belt. Contrary to a lot of press speculation beforehand, the white paper doesn't weaken protections for the green belt one jot. Indeed, it actually increases protection for ancient woodlands and veteran trees, something I'm sure the CPRE welcomes. Around 11% of the surface area of England is already developed, and a further 13% is green belt. Uh, allowing for the fact that 40% is covered by protective designations such as national parks, there is still plenty of other land to build on without having to concrete over swathes of our precious green belt. Some greenfield land will be required for new homes, but our focus as a government is on developing brownfield land, specifically in those parts of the country where additional homes are required. We'll be amending the national planning policy framework to increase the take-up of brownfield sites suitable for homes, prevent low-density developments where there's clearly a shortage of land, and support proposals for starter homes on employment land that has been vacant or unviable for five years. These are merely the latest steps to bring brownfield land back into use. Together with the Mayor, we've designated 57 brownfield housing zones around the country that have the potential for 77,000 new homes. The £3 billion Home Building Fund will support development on brownfield land, as will the £1.2 billion Starter Home Land Fund. We've legislated for the introduction of brownfield registers so developers of all sizes can easily find suitable sites. And permission in principle, the legislation for which I'm taking through the House at 4.30 this afternoon, um, will provide a new route for planning permission that gives upfront certainty for developers. As your Head of Planning, Matt Thompson, acknowledged last week, this government has done a great deal to prioritise regeneration and make the most of our existing housing stock. We've widened permitted development rights so that new homes can be delivered by converting commercial buildings. We've provided funding to encourage estate regeneration projects across the country. And we've done more than any government to bring empty homes back into use through the new homes bonus and council tax changes. The number of empty homes has fallen by a third since 2010 and now stands at the lowest level since records began. But as I explained earlier, planning for the right number of homes in the right places won't fix our broken housing market on its own. The evidence of the last seven years proves that. Thanks to the planning reforms my predecessors introduced, English councils granted planning permission for a record number of homes in the 12 months to September 2016. 277,000 homes. Now, if I was confident that all of those homes would be built quickly, we wouldn't have needed to publish a housing white paper. But I'm not confident. There is a large and growing gap between homes being granted planning permission and homes actually being started and people cannot live in a planning permission. So the second chapter of the white paper focuses on what we need to do to get planning permissions built out quicker. We've listened to all the things developers say slow them down. Viability assessments, section 106 agreements, misuse of pre-commencement conditions, infrastructure delays, and we're taking action to deal with all of those issues. Having addressed all of their concerns, we're entitled to expect developers to build out a lot quicker. And if they don't, we're giving councils new powers to tackle the problem. Shorter timescales for implementing permissions, more streamlined completion notice procedures, and new guidance encouraging more active use of compulsory purchase powers at stalled housing sites. And having given councils the powers they've been asking for, we're introducing a new housing delivery test to hold them to account if they don't ensure the homes they've planned for are actually built. It's all very well insisting local councils have plans, but what we need, and what I'm ultimately going to be measured by by the Prime Minister, is getting those homes built. And the white paper takes us a significant stage forward in that regard. Now, build-out rates will also be quicker if we have a more dynamic and competitive house-building market. And that's what the third chapter of the white paper tries to achieve. Small independent builders were decimated in the 2008 recession, and many have never come back, while new companies find it very difficult to enter the market. So at the moment, 60% of new private homes are built by just 10 companies, using methods that haven't changed much for the past century. 
A lack of competition is never good for innovation, something our housing market is in desperate need of. So we're going to make it easier for small and medium-sized builders to compete and encourage innovation. That means access to finance for small and medium-sized builders and those using innovative methods of construction, such as off-site, through programmes such as our £3 billion Home Building Fund. And it means councils ensuring that there are smaller sites that are suitable for SME developers available in their local plans. We'll also make things easier for custom builders. Richard Bacon is in the audience here in front of me. He's a huge champion for self-build and custom build. Many other countries do far more in that regard than we can do, and there's huge potential there. Uh, and we also want um, to encourage institutional investment into the private renter sector so that we get pension funds coming in and building new homes for private rent. And we want housing associations and local councils to build more. The private sector cannot solve this problem on its own. In the 1950s and 60s, when we did build enough homes, councils made a significant contribution. And while no one wants to go back to large, monotenure estates, council-owned local housing companies and housing associations have a crucial role to play in building the homes that we need. To make that point absolutely clear, my approach as housing minister is very simple. The more people that get involved in building homes in this country, the happier I will be. So I said I wanted a conversation. Um, so I'm keen to move on to questions. Uh, but let me finish where I started, on the value that we place on your input. We recognise your concern for the preservation of the English landscape is shared by millions of people across this country. Indeed, as a government, we share it too. We've listened to you on housing and planning issues, and we're implementing many of your ideas. But in return, we want your help. I'm delighted that your leadership recognise the urgent requirement to fix the broken housing market in this country. Now I want those words matched with practical positive action. Every year that passes, this problem gets bigger, the solutions get more difficult, and the consequences for our children and grandchildren get worse and worse. We must build more homes of the type people want to live in and in the places where they're needed. And that requires both new thinking and a tireless commitment to deliver on the ground, not just from the government, but from everybody with an interest in our housing market, including the CPRE. We won't always agree on every single issue, but I challenge you to work alongside us so together we can both preserve our precious countryside and build the homes this country so desperately needs and make this a country that works for everyone. Thank you very much indeed.